Hi friends, in this video I will discuss new scalable quantum technology, huge milestone in quantum teleportation, and then third, some brand new quantum devices that use new phase of matter. Very exciting! First of all, researchers from MIT made a breakthrough in quantum computing. They've developed a quantum system on a chip that features a special type of qubits that are no bigger than a single atom. And this is really interesting because, you know, there are hundreds of quantum computers being built all over the world, and each use different methods for building qubits. Qubit is a quantum analog of a classical bit that leverages the principles of quantum mechanics. The most popular and mature quantum technology right now is superconducting qubit, and this has been pursued by companies like Google, D-Wave, and many other startups. One of the biggest problems with this technology is scalability. So the ability to scale to a larger number of qubits in a system without compromising the performance. Currently, the largest quantum computers run on a few thousand qubits, which is still very far from making it practical. However, scalability is limited by many, many factors, and one of them is the size of qubits. So what's wrong with it? You know, our traditional silicon chips that I cover in depth on my channel, like GPUs, CPUs, AI chips, they are made up of billions of transistors fitting on a very tiny piece of silicon. The fact is that most of these chips are much smaller than individual superconducting qubits. So, how can we build a quantum system with millions of interconnected qubits that we can control? This is exactly the problem the researchers from MIT are solving with teen vacancy qubits. Let me explain how it works. Let's start with the fact that we all love diamonds. And what is so beautiful about them is, of course, their quantum properties. A diamond, so a pure diamond, is made of a repeating crystal of carbon atoms. But those diamonds that shine the most, they have impurities in them. And in this work, the researchers from MIT took a diamond and imbued it with tin atoms. They were basically bombarding the diamond with tin ions. As a result, we have a diamond with some implanted tin ions and many vacancies. Afterwards, the diamond was heated and so-called tin vacancy centers were formed. And these act as a single entity that has quantum properties. And we can actually control these properties with electromagnetic waves, for example. So let's say a microwave at just the right frequency can flip a tin vacancy center from zero to up or down. So in this way, we get qubits that we can entangle and we can compute with them. You see, these structures are just the size of a single atom, so they have a much better scaling perspectives than any other type of qubits. Now, let me know what you think in the comments. So, in this work, the team from MIT created a quantum system on a chip that features 1024 of such teen vacancy qubits. You know, over the last couple of years, I talked a lot about this system on a chip concept. Like Apple's M chips with the latest M4 in 3 nanometers. System on a chip refers to integrating all the components like memory, processor, and IOS into a single piece of silicon. And now we have a quantum system on a chip. Of course, it doesn't have a memory in the way classical computers do, because they use quantum bits for both storing and computing the information. So this quantum system on a chip features qubits and interconnects, so we connect many of such chips together to scale it up. And in the paper they mentioned that it's possible to connect a thousand of such chips to come to a 1 million qubit milestone. What is so important here that we want more than just 1 million qubits? We want 1 million qubits with good fidelity, so that they are accurate and reliable. And that's what's so hard to achieve. We will talk more about it later in the video.
Another aspect I find super interesting about this work that because these diamond colored centers are solid state systems, they are actually compatible with our CMOS fabrication process. And this is the process that we've mastered so very well over the past couple of decades. Now it's getting very interesting because this 1024 qubits fit into a 500 micron by 500 micron area. And what is fascinating is that this qubit density is actually close to the transistor density of the most, one of the most advanced CMOS process nodes. They write in the paper that it's comparable to TSMC's N3 node. Wow, it doesn't get any better than that. To give you a feeling of what this is like, here is an example of an older quantum chip with 49 qubits that is 4 centimeters to 4 centimeters of size. Only for 49 measly qubits. How does this sound? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. It's worth mentioning that what you saw, it was one of the older Intel quantum chips. And now Intel is working on silicon quantum dots technology, which is extremely promising technology and there have been some very exciting advances so we're gonna talk about it in the second part of the video. A part of the scaling challenges we've discussed two critical challenges remain. It's cooling and error correction. The cooling is required because qubits are quite fragile so any noise or vibrations from the environment can destroy the information contained in the qubits. That's why we always try to protect them. And that's why when you're in the room with a working quantum computer, you have to stay quiet. Joking. Actually, by noise here, we don't mean any loud sound. We mean random bits of energy, which can be in the form of microwaves or heat. Most of the time, the main problem is thermal noise. And you can actually very well see it from this equation. You can see that it's proportional to the temperature. And from this, you can understand why we need to try to keep it cool. So actually, at temperatures closest to absolute zero, at which quantum systems typically operate, the thermal noise is very low. And this is also the case for tin vacancy qubits, but these can operate at a slightly higher temperatures at 4 Kelvin, which is about 1000 times better, but still far from a dream of making a quantum computer working at room temperature. Now, researchers from MIT are focusing on further scaling the system, of course, but especially on the error correction algorithms, because at the moment, they're experiencing error rates of about 10%. Error rate is basically a probability of undesired change in the state of the qubit. So 10% error rate means that every 10 out of 100 operations result in an error. So 10% error rate is actually disastrous. In general, modern quantum computers have error rates from 1% to 0.1% and we will talk about it later in the video because there have been some very exciting progress. But just to give you a feeling, achieving quantum supremacy requires us to achieve an error rate of one failure per trillion quantum operations. So we are far away. Moreover, you typically need more physical qubits to build, let's say, 100 of logical qubits, those that you then can access with algorithms and uh, software. You see, that's why scaling is so essential. Now, before we discuss a huge milestone in quantum teleportation and the special qubits that leverage a new face of matter, I think one of the big problems we face nowadays is the rapid spread of information that is hard to verify. Internet algorithms make it even worse. Most of the time, we don't know where information is coming from and if it's reliable. Ground News, the sponsor of this video, is solving this problem. They gather articles from all around the world in one place so you can compare how different media outlets cover them. They also provide context about the news sources, political bias, credibility and ownership so readers can see how these factors influence an article reporting. 
and all of this backed by ratings from three independent news monitoring organizations. You can easily stay up to date on issues that matter the most to you. That's why I use Ground News to stay informed about what's happening in the world, including technology and science. I think they're a really powerful tool for making sure you see the bigger picture. So check them out for yourself. Go to ground.news slash Anastasia or scan my QR code here for 40% off the same Vantage plan I use for unlimited access to all their features. Ground News is independent and supported by their subscribers. So by signing up, you directly supporting the development of more transparent and objective media landscape. You know, in general, there are different things we want to do in quantum ecosystem. First of all, we want to build qubits, and then we want to build a quantum computer out of it. And then we want to network these computers. Think about distributed computing. And there have been huge news recently. So Photonic, in collaboration with Microsoft, was able to transfer quantum information between two distant qubits. But before we talk about this success, we have to talk about silicon quantum dots. As you know, quantum computers use qubits to store and process information. And there are multiple types of qubits, like superconducting qubits, depth ions, diamond vacancies that we've just discussed in the first part of the video. And then there is silicon quantum dots technology. I'm keeping an eye on the last one because it's very promising and that's the technology that's based on silicon. Now, if I explain it in a layman terms, the idea is to take a transistor and inside is laid a single electron in the channel and then using its spin as a state of a qubit. So this technology is basically leveraging our standard CMOS technology to build qubits. And this is something we know very well. Until now, have managed to scale it down to 1.6 nanometers and pack hundreds of millions of transistors in a tiny, tiny area of silicon. So this technology is scalable for mass production. And exactly this technology is behind this experiment. So what's really neat about the photonic platform is they have what's called a T-center. So at the core of their device, they have this T-Center and it has a mixture, if you will, of types of qubits, right? So it has not only a, what we call a spin qubit, um, but it also can emit a photon. And because it can emit a photon, right? A photon can travel, right? It's light. It can travel in, a, in, in fiber optics. And so what Photonic's been able to do is demonstrate this in their, in their platform, right? For the first time. So they have two separated cryostats. There's about 40 meters of fiber optics uh, between them. So imagine, right, a, a fiber, uh, 40 meters of fiber connecting these two cryostats. And inside these cryostats are these T-centers, right, the, a quantum device in each one. And so those quantum devices, um, you can shine light, you know, shine a light to excite and, and release a photon. So each release a photon. Um, and once they are detected at, uh, at the same time, essentially, then you perform in each cryostat a series of operations on each T-center. And this actually enables the entanglement across uh, these two cryostats. So we call this um, distributed entanglement or the ability to do remote entanglement. Um, and you do it right without having to interact interact what's inside those two cryostats, right? They interact via the photons, the light that travels across the fiber. You know, just like classical computers, quantum computers perform operations on logic gates. And these logic gates convert input into a certain output. And one type of a quantum logic gate is so-called controlled NOT gate or C NOT gate. This is a controlled NOT operation. So what it means is based on the value of one of the bits, you want to flip the other bit. Now, in our case, these are qubits, uh, but it's still the same same idea, right? If this bit is zero, then don't flip this, cu this qubit. Mm -hmm. And if this qubit is one, we're going to flip this qubit. And so basically that's what's done here is, is a controlled NOT operation between the cryostats, um, but done 
done by only locally operating on the qubits. And so we call this a teleported controlled knot operation. In order to scale quantum computers to larger systems, we need to achieve entanglement, not only between qubits in one chip, but between qubits located in as two separate chips. And recently, Photonic and Microsoft successfully implemented it. This is a significant milestone in quantum entanglement. So as we have these networked uh, machines, right, and longer distance connection ultimately will look like a quantum internet that will you know, essentially run alongside your classical internet, right? It doesn't replace your classical internet, but it gives additional capabilities on top of your classical internet. Now, there is another technology which is extremely promising for building practical quantum computers. I don't know if you heard about it. It's a relatively new flavor of qubits, so-called topological qubits. And it's very interesting because there have been some great breakthroughs recently. First of all, this type of qubits is particularly interesting because unlike other type of qubits we've just discussed that are based usually on particles such as ions, electrons or photons, these qubits are based on a topological state or um, phase of matter. With our topological qubits, um, these are based on a very, you know, you, you would say new type of physics, right? So the idea is actually to create um, a new phase. It's called a topological phase, right? When you think of phases of matter, you have, you know, liquid, uh, gas, solid. We actually engineer a new phase of matter in the device. It's called a topological phase of matter. So this is a very new property. It's it's essentially a nanowire. Um, it's it's a um, a superconducting nanowire. Essentially, what you're doing is controlling these nanowires and driving them into this topological phase. And then what emerges is the ability to use this as a qubit. To put it simple, we have a nanowire, and on both sides of it, we have quantum dots which practically works like a gate in a classical transistor. It's controlling the flow of electrons through this wire. And when we close this gate, some of the electrons are trapped in the wire. And actually, the number of these trapped electrons defines the state of qubit. And the quantum information in this case is stored on both ends. Let's say it's stored on both ends of this wire. And these ends are about 3 microns apart. And this is exactly what makes it resilient, because it's very unlikely that this noise particle will hit at both ends uh, of this wire at the same time. So topological qubits promise to be 100 to 1000 times better in terms of noise. And this is huge for quantum computing. The thing here is that the quantum information in this case is stored in the properties of the entire system rather than in the properties of individual particles or atoms. So it's inherently more stable. Now, these electrons are very sensitive to any noise from the environment or any radiation or waves or energy hits from the outside. That's why they added special Majorana particles to the system. These particles have some very unique properties that protect these electrons from the noise. I've simplified it a lot, of course, but this is the basic idea behind. So by, by having this natural protection at the hardware level, we can start at a, a better air rate, right? So that physical qubit promises to have, say, one in 10,000, only one fault in 10,000 operations at the physical level, or even one fault in a million, which is even better, right? So we call that 10 to the minus 5 or 10 to the minus 6 air rate. So that's several you know, orders of magnitude better than many of the other uh, qubits uh, in existence today. This new type of qubit essentially uh, promises uh, really great scalability, right? Because it has the right speed, the right size, the right controllability, and its fidelity is much better uh, than other types of qubits out there today. Uh, and so we believe this is you know, a very promising approach to scaling up. 
Now, of course, they need to work on scaling it to a larger number of qubits and building logic gates out of it and eventually performing millions of quantum operations per second. I'm pretty sure that quantum computing will bring us a lot of exciting surprises already in this century. And this will be definitely fun to follow. I hope you will stay with the channel, so please consider subscribing not to miss the future episodes about the advances in quantum computing and leave me a comment below what you think about it. As you may have noticed, I took a very long break. I was almost one and a half months away from YouTube and I have to say I missed you guys so badly, very much. Uh, but I was very busy working on a new project um, I've made a huge change in my career and the original plan was to share it in this video, but I want to wait a bit until things are completely up and fully functional. For now, let's stay in touch. Let's connect on LinkedIn. I personally love to talk to you on LinkedIn, guys, because I love to see who is behind the screen, you know, to whom I'm talking to. So now I want to make a small giveaway of the book, which I just read beautiful book one of the best reads this year uh, it's called i may be wrong so i want to give it away uh, among those who leave a comment under the video and you just mentioned that you want to win a book because i know not everyone likes to read so uh, and then i will send it to you thank you for watching and i will see you in the next video very soon ciao